on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How's it going there? Hope all is well. John is here, is dancing, which is a kind of a vaguely accurate Dad description. dancing. Dad dancing to Miley Cyrus, John. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realise you were a Miley Cyrus fan. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Did you hear her cover of? Zombie. It's pretty good. It's very good, actually. It's very, very good. Look, for all no. the shtick that she gets, she's actually a very good singer. She is a good singer. We could go down the Taylor Swift road as well. Steady on there now. Mark. All right. <laughs> I have, again, you have to be very, very broad in our musical tastes. Indeed, my friend. Just a 54 year old man. Exactly. <laughs> Speaking of music, I believe you've got a song for us. Have a listen. Reasons to be cheerful, part three. Health service glasses, gigolos and brasses, round or skinny bottoms. Take him on to Paris, lighting up the chalice. We Willie Harris. Man to Stephen Beacon, listening to Rico. Harper Groucho Chico. Cheddar cheese and pickle, the Vincent motorcycle. Slap and tickle. Reasons to be cheerful. One, two, three. That's uh, Ian Jury and the Blockheads. Actually passed away not that long ago in Jury, about four or five years ago. Yeah, well, he probably survived longer than he possibly should have. Yeah. Given born, his lifestyle. He actually, interesting, but he contracted polio. Yeah. Which was eradicated by a vaccine. We want to talk about vaccines because that's actually what happened to, to injury. This is your reason to be cheerful, isn't it? The vaccine. Absolutely. Well, I think there's there's three reasons. This was a good week, by and large, in possibly the worst year since 535. The, the, the Justinian plague. The Justinian plague brought on by Krakatoa. But that's that's for another podcast. The Justinian plague. Are we going Byzantine? Or are we going back? Are we going? Are we twenty twenty? Are we going to Byzantium? No, no. Let Let's stay twenty twenty because okay. there's enough going on. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So, so but you know had, my weakness for Byzantium. Uh, I know. I know. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to pull you away from that okay. just for now. <laughs> so we've had this week. We've had well, of course, Biden and the whole Trump thing. Yeah. That's a reason to be cheerful. We've had the vaccine, which is a massive reason to be cheerful. Absolutely. And then we have Brexit. Well, what we have coming up in Brexit is the crunch negotiations. Also, rats leaving the sinking ship. Well, that's what I was referring to. Dominic Cummins and the other fellow, the other fellow who actually looks like. Do you remember Lee Carsley, who used to play football for Ireland, <laughs> played for Everton, skinhead lad. No. The other fellow, Lee Cairn, or whatever he looks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he I looks know. Like, <laughs> he looks like one of those. You know, there's a sort of there's a certain type of football in the Premiership that has moved around by clubs trying to avoid relegation. And he always is, he's, he's like, he's a solid workman like, you know, holding midfielder, like Lee Carsey. That's what he looks like. In right. fact, they all look like retired. But, you know, your point is very valid. And it is true that, by the way, how are you doing? Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. all, that, all that usual lark. We just forgot about that. We just turned on the mics. We're having a chat. Hope life is well. Hope you had a good weekend. Hope you had a good week. All that stuff. We're not going to mention the soccer. We might mention the rugby. We're not going to mention the soccer. But there's been lots of. Reasons to be actually there is just one thing I have to mention about the soccer. Okay, go on. Just before the match, you know, when they're doing the the national anthem, the whole lot. Did you see on ITV they're playing the Irish national anthem? Our on the vein. Our on the vein. But very helpfully, they decided they'd put up the subtitles to the lyrics of the song. And they put up the wrong song. What did they put up? They put up the shoulder to shoulder, Ireland's Uh, call. I am not serious. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, the shoulder, I don't get the shoulder to shoulder one. I don't get it. But look, we will move on. Yeah, we will yeah, yeah. move on. Brexit. Let's talk about Brexit. But why don't we talk to a brilliant, brilliant economist? Okay, Adam Posen is the head of the Peterson Institute, okay, of international affairs. It's the number one think tank in the world on international affairs. Really? This is a guy, it's in Washington. This is a guy who was on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England for three years, deep in policy making, deep in the the establishment. When was that? He was under Mark Carney's, so I don't know, about five, six years ago. Yeah, 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 very, very recently. Adam is an amazing economist, expert on Japan, expert on international relations. Again, as I was saying, worked at the epicentre in the UK, and is now 
the head honcho of the number one think tank in the world on international affairs. So let's talk to him. Adam, 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 you are in the States. Tell me, what do you make of the latest... Before we do Brexit, before we do the UK, before we do anything, tell me about the United States. What's your take? We're a divided society, David, and that's not good, especially since I... Without wanting to sound cute, I think the cause of truth and justice is all on one side. Um, There's a bunch of people who are really not happy about change, about diminishing police violence, about treating people of color and women equally. Um, So it's bad. And uh, we're all sort of looking at things and saying, oh, that's better than I feared. So there was very little open, violent voter intimidation ahead of the election. So and there's been very little violent protests since then. And you saw Farage pointing to the boarded up shops in DC and it turned out none of them had to be boarded up. So, you know, that's good. Okay, that's good. To a terrible baseline. The firings of the top defense Defense department officials by Trump do not seem to have actually been a coup. That's good. That's good, okay. But, you know, we're, we're sort of clutching at straws here. I mean, obviously, I'm very excited and in favor of President-elect Biden, and they've announced a transition, and we can talk about the economic implications, the policy, and the health implications, and they're all positive. But the underlying stresses and problems in the U.S. government and the U.S. society are still there. And, you know, when you say the underlying, let's, you know, briefly, because, I mean, we've talked a lot about the U.S. a lot in the podcast, but it's critical for us to have that, dare I say it, that American broad brush view. I mean, what is wrong in your, like your top four or five? What is wrong with the United States? Um, What's wrong with the United States, which is kind of scary, is divisions, geographic and racial, that go back 150 years are still with us. And in recent years, there's been a huge further geographic sorting, and I know you've talked about this conceptually and and in economic terms with some of your your guests and over time, and there's a lot of evidence now that the sorting of who's rural, who's urban, and how it it plays out um, has happened, um, has intensified. And so, you know, there, there are all kinds of figures out there on the interwebs you can pick up, like the fact that Biden may have gotten, you know, 52, 53% of the voting public, but where Biden won has over 70% of GDP. So the, uh, so, the, so the winners are with Biden? The winners are with Biden for the most part. I mean, the very, very top winners who are trying to keep their tech taxes off their wealth are not, but except for them, they are. But it, that's not quite right either, though, because the real working class people still voted majority for for Biden too. It's, so it's really along racial and cultural lines, not economic lines. Well, can we just stick before we go, because we're going to talk to you about Brexit, because re- Brexit is clearly a racial stroke cultural sure. project. It's Absolutely. not a... We, we it's, know it's, it's not... Very, a, it's very analogous. It's very analogous. So, so, so you know, we, we know in the UK that Brexit comes from a nationalist perspective. It's, it's largely an English notion, you know, maybe a bit of Wales stuck onto it, but I mean, it's an English idea. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely. a national idea. You can argue in the broad sweep of history, it's the end of the English project that started, let's say, in the 16th century here in Ireland, yeah. actually. You know, you can you can yeah. look at it that way, that the, that was a big, long 400-year adventure, project, yeah. imperial uh, effort, and now it's kind of on its last legs. You can stick yeah. But what's the American equivalent? It's a very fair question. The American equivalent is the... I don't want to say disenfranchisement, but the displacement of the less educated white male from a safe space in the hierarchy. So okay. that sounds very disembodied in social science, but it's very visceral. Okay. It, it's about the, the less educated white male being able to lord it over people, whether it's his female family members or people who look different from him or people who are pencil pushers or whatever, and they are no longer able to do that and or they are increasingly unable to do that. And so they retreat to smaller and smaller, more homogeneous communities 
where they can try to maintain that. So it's the Imperial Project, it's the, it's the racial segregation and associated right-wing values are finally being fundamentally challenged. So, so, so the picture you're painting, you know, I was thinking in, in pictures, you know, like you've got the, the John Wayne sort of characters, you know, from the 1950s America, right? Even, you know, the recent like Netflix series, like some like Mad Men, you know, that you're, you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're looking at a sort of a, a historical or even a musical. It's like a West Side story. It's all this sort of that type of America where a white working class guy, Irish, Italian, usually are English Protestant wasp, could go out to work, could earn a decent wage could, as you say, lord it over people around him. And largely that is a 40, 50 year project that has actually ended. I think you're being too nice to these people, David. <laughs> you know, they're, not, okay. they're, they're not behaving badly. Adam, I'm a nice guy. I've, you know, I've always been, yeah, I've always got to <laughs> But it's misleading. Um, they're not, you know, this was the phrase that got bandied about after the 2016 election. They're not behaving badly because they've been economically hurt because they can't make a living. They're behaving badly because they resent people who don't look like them and don't believe as they do getting ahead. If you look at the actual numbers, the, the this, this constant story about all oh, these poor people can't make a living, it's, it, it's a vast exaggeration at best. And it's, and it's fundamentally not true. So you, you've had a certain set of iconic, or iconic jobs in certain places, like the fetishization of steam, of shipbuilding in Northern Ireland, right? In Belfast, yeah. right? You've had, you've had certain specific kinds of jobs, auto and steel workers in certain states that are not as plentiful as they once were. Well, you know, a lot of people didn't have those jobs in the first place. A lot of people who lost those jobs have gone on to other things. A lot of places have risen up in place of those. So Pittsburgh died and came back. Detroit died and is coming back. Charlotte, North Carolina, Tempe, Arizona came out of nowhere. And then the two other points. First, some of this is even on the economic, to the degree it's driven by economics, it's driven very fundamentally by perceptions, not reality. So after tax and benefits, right? So as miserly as the U.S. welfare state is, but after tax adjustments and benefits given to people, and especially by the time you put in Obamacare, people were were genuinely better off. The wage bill they were getting may not have gone up very much, but their actual real income had improved a lot over the last few decades. But that doesn't satisfy them. Similarly, there's high-frequency polling data out there about high quality, high frequency polling data about people's perceptions of the economy. You know, is the economy doing well? Is the economy doing badly? Well, the polls taken since the election a week and a half ago, suddenly Republicans' perception of the economy pl- on that questionnaire plummeted by 20, 30 points and Democrats rose by almost as much. So oh, wow. this isn't about, don't make this something about all oh, those poor displaced guys. That's not what this is about. <laughs> well, it's you know, it's funny you mentioned, and we go, I won't, we won't go off on this tangent, but it's an interesting. One. You mentioned Belfast and shipbuilding, because I was watching Northern Ireland play football last night. They lost in Windsor Park at home to Slovakia, right? But what I was, it was intrigued was the chance in Northern. So, the Northern Irish displaced loyalist guys who follow the Northern Ireland football team are very, very similar, very analogous to the people you're talking about. It's not so much that their position has been eroded, but other people's positions, you know, basically the uppity Catholics have done much better than them over the last 30 or 40 years, you know? And so the the songs they sing is, it's quite interesting. If you look at football songs and what they sing, Northern Ireland sings this uh, extraordinary song called Ten German Bombers, which is basically an English uh, right-wing Very, very much National Front thing, uh, talking about the RAF shooting down German bombers in the Second World War. So what you have is what you have is people from Northern Ireland, and of course they were involved in this because they were they were British and they were involved. But rather than talk about something vaguely hopeful, something vaguely joyous, something vaguely material to Northern Ireland, they talk, they sing, ten English bombers shot down by the RAF who happened to come from Ulster, which is not true. And and that's. 
sad, horrifying, and perfect because the analogy in the U.S. are all the Civil War reenactors and the people who kept the Confederate flag alive, even if their parents emigrated to the U.S. after the Civil War or they, or they were not, they Within. certainly obviously didn't participate in the Civil War on the Confederate side. And that used to be that a lot of, there were certain cultural things, talk about sport. So NASCAR, the auto Oh, oh yes, we know NASCAR. NASCAR. Yeah, yeah. Well, so NASCAR had been resolutely good old boy, explicitly about where these people, not those people. And then because it got more popular and because the drivers and the owners decided to get more enlightened, they started losing their core white supporters because and interest because they were saying, no, it's okay to have a black driver. No, it's not okay to have a Confederate stars and bars on your car and so on. So yeah, it's the same kind it's the, of. It's the same thing. Right? No, it's, it's actually funny because you know, sport as we know as economists, right? Is we've got to open the door wide to look at societies, and we've got to look at all these other things. Sport is always, for me, a fantastic leading indicator of where the tribe is moving and and how you can yeah. gather things. You know. So let's let's talk. Speaking, we we were talking about ten German bombers, right? Which is again, as I say, the English national, not the English national, a section of the English football crowd sing it all the time. Brexit. English bombers, German bombers, Second World War, fight them on the beaches, yada, yada, yada. Let's talk about the pickle the Brits have got themselves into. Yeah, which of course has enormous spillover effects on Ireland, as you... Yeah, as we, as we, as we know... Um, um, audience um, knows. Yeah, so yeah. you were at the Bank of England, you were making policy, you were deep... Tell me, what from an economic perspective is Brexit going to do to the United Kingdom economy? Uh, it, it very straightforwardly, Brexit is the UK declaring a trade war on not just its closest partners, but itself. So you have a situation where there is barrier free trade and movement between the UK and the rest of Europe. And now you're having a negotiation about which barriers to put up. Um, which is which is a which is unheard of. You've never had a negotiation. It's basically unprecedented like, for a, a, a democracy with high income and economy at a minimum. In most places, it's just unprecedented. You throw in the fact that the there's so much that's not having to do with trade and goods and stuff, right? So, you know, obviously Ireland is enormously affected by physical goods trade, agricultural goods in particular, other things. But, you know, the UK economy is hugely based on services, cultural goods, exports of university, exports of professional services, the City of London financial services, its role as a headquarters for various European operations of global multinationals. And by not being part of the single market, whether or not Boris makes a deal or no deal at this last minute, by not being part of the single market, they're going to lose all that over time. They're not going to have their qualifications recognized. They're not going to have be an attractive place. Ireland may gain from this, in fact, of companies saying, okay, I want to have an English-speaking rule of law, comfy, low tax place to be in Europe. UK isn't it anymore. Okay, Ireland's next best thing along with Netherlands. So yeah, no, that. I think ourselves and the, the wily, canny Dutchman will do well, as the Dutch always yeah. do. The Dutch always do yeah, well yeah, in these yeah. gigs. They so, so, I mean, those, those are the big picture things. I, I think additionally... So the, the argument is about, um, you know, it's essentially an anti-immigration argument. And we know, I refer to the work of my friend and colleague, Jonathan Portis at King's College London, who's done huge work on this after being in the government. We know that immigrants have in general been good for societies and not that bad, if at all, for low-wage workers. In the UK, it's even more so. It's been huge net payments from the Polish plumbers and the French hotel workers into the social security system, doing jobs in agriculture and retail and and, and hospitality that the, the English are too well paid to and too snotty to do. It's been making UK more attractive by making it a more diverse, lively place. It's been paying for their universities by bringing in foreign students paying full freight. So, you know, it's motivated by throwing up barriers to immigration, really, if you look back at what the campaign was about, you look at the scare tactics. And so then finally, you're, you're reduced to people arguing, well, the real reason we're doing this is because the Euro, Euro or Europe is in trouble. And, you know, at, at starting in 2010, that was maybe a better argument to make. But then you shouldn't be lying that there are the sunny uplands or whatever the hell they're saying at the moment uh, as a result of Brexit. 
And I think the European problems are exaggerated in the sense that the UK was not going to have to be part of the euro and was already a low tax, low regulation jurisdiction compared to the rest, most of the rest of the EU. One final thing is one of the few things in economics that's, that's real is what we call gravity, gravity models of trade, that you trade over time with places you've interacted with historically and you're close to. This is why there's more trade with Ireland than almost anybody for the UK except China. I know, um, it's, it's kind of extraordinary. Right, and, and this, then that's gravity. That's historical and geographic proximity. And so UK can join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The UK can try to make itself Singapore on the Thames, but it's not going to work. Yeah, I mean, it's what it always struck me is that if you look at the countries that are much really integrated with the UK, it's Ireland, Netherlands, Denmark, and that bit of northern France that feeds lots of the UK and western Germany. So basically, this neck of the woods, this part of the world. And, I, and I, I do think it's very fanciful when I hear that, you know, we're going to have trade deals with Japan and Korea, and we'll have trade deals with Indonesia and Malaysia and all this. But I want, to, I want to come back to the economics of it. What do you think is going to happen when it becomes apparent, let's say this year, next year, two or three years, that Brexit economically is shambolic, that Britain ends up having to go backwards, that Britain ends up... I'm, not, I'm trying to figure out, Adam, what their, what their model is. What, where do they see themselves? What are, what's their big vision of this? I mean, is there any country that's ever done anything like this? To give them, like, what, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to give them their dues. Is there actually, is there any place we can say, well, hold on a second, here's a model Britain could follow? Um, the short answer is not really. I mean, in a sense... You know, as you and I have discussed in the past, Ireland, you know, ran a very aggressive policy on taxes, on getting Americans in and other companies in, on uh, multilateral profit shifting, on various things. And it paid off for Ireland. And Ireland got away with it in part because it had certain virtues, in part because it was small, and in part it had buddies in the U.S. Congress. And so you could, you could make it work. And now Ireland's starting to run up against the limits of that. The UK can't really do that. It's too big. It's got, it's an alienated most of its friends. And the kinds of things that they want to do, which are higher employment, would, would require more than what Ireland has been able to offer. And, and so the, the Ireland's sort of a model. And so you can come up with, if you'll forgive the expression, race to the bottom models, where instead of Singapore on the Thames, the UK becomes Cayman Islands on the Thames. And so even more than The Guardian and others have been reporting on, it becomes a haven for oligarchs and sheiks and uh, you've, you've just described you've, you've just described Kensington really well right. at the moment. Well, I mean, well that's what it moment. is now. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, you can go down that path a ways, but that's in addition to its moral distinctions. Um, it, it has uh, political foreign policy implications you may not like. But I mean, it's just on the economics. It, it politically, look, the, the English majority, and you're right, it's English with a few benighted people in Wales, can decide, you know, this is more important a project to us than whatever the economic costs are. But coming up with a model is very hard. I mean, so there are fanatics who believe that Europe is fundamentally socialist, corrupt, nationalist, bad, and that getting out from Europe will somehow liberate the economy in an enormous way. But what we've seen is repeatedly, even under the Johnson or the May governments, that they were going to do heavily interventionist government policies to make up for things that they were getting from Europe. And some of the regulations that they were complaining about were ones the UK had advocated for or even initiated in Europe. So, you know, there's plenty of fantasies out there, but you can't make the economic case. Well, you know what strikes me? I mean, it sounds like a very extreme version, but every now and then, I've planned about four or five times over the last 10 years, maybe, maybe over the last 12 years, I visited Argentina, and Argentina always is a shocking warning of bad things that can happen to very good countries when leaders get notions. And, you know, if you, if you look at Argentinians who emigrated after the Second World War, Italians in particular who emigrated to Argentina, they had a choice. I, I have one particular family in mind, and they went to Buenos Aires, and the other part of the family went to Boston. 
and their lives have turned out profoundly different. When I hear Johnson talk about sort of intervention to create uh, national champions in the north of England and the Midlands and to create this new Silicon Valley, and when I hear the rhetoric of patriotism and when I hear the big state, it's this sort of red trousers and blue collar idea. It sounds to me, and it sounds, it might sound extreme, it sounds like Peronism. Yeah, that's good. That's a good line. It's also true. So colleagues of mine at the Peterson Institute, Monica Debola, Madi Sarsambayev, and some, some people who have gone elsewhere, that I've been doing and are about to finish a book length big project for us on what we call economic nationalism. And we think that's a better term than Peronism or populism for capturing there are these common threads. And, but I mean, we, we sort of go through, or I shouldn't say we, they, they, the authors go through various of these cases going back to the late 18th century, going back to the U.S. as the development case, obviously Italy and Germany and Spain in the third 20s and 30s, obviously Argentina under the Baroness, and so on. And what you find is you get these situations of economic nationalism, buy at home, and you usually get a boom-bust cycle because you can get a little bit of a growth burst at the start if, if people are willing to extend you credit. But you're, you're eating away at the economy and you end up not generally improving the working class's uh, situation for very, very long. And you end up with a lot of corruption. And this is the cycle. We've seen it repeatedly. And, and the UK is going to try to do that in a situation where they're already suffering from the pandemic and they never really got back from the entirely from the uh global financial crisis of a decade ago. Because this is what, I mean, this is what really strikes me, I know, is that, you know, if you walk around Buenos Aires, you walk around and you say, wow, this place was a real boom town at some stage. You look at the architecture, you look at, and in the architecture, you have the ambition of the society, the ambition of the oligarchs of that society. And you look at and you say, these guys had everything going for them and they got it wrong and they got it incredibly badly wrong, so much so that I don't think there's a country on earth that has performed as badly as Argentina over the last 40 or 50 year period. What I'm saying is this could happen. That's very, that's very insightful. And again, going back to our earlier conversation, that kind of thing could apply to large parts of the US now, whereas it used to be the patriotism was with, you know, one of the highest voluntary compliance with taxes in the world, uh, voluntary military service, uh, willingness to comply. And now, of course, we've got people fighting against uh, Obamacare ACA because they don't want to be compelled to pay into the mandate. And we've got people refusing to take vaccines and we've got people refusing to tax. I don't want to exaggerate it. I mean, even a majority of the Trump voters are not that. But I think, you know, sort of going back to Thatcher, that you you can't you say there's no society you say there's no state and uh, yet you try to be nationalist you end up with a very warped situation yeah but i think that's where the uk i think that's where england is going and there are many examples around the world of good countries that went bad many examples in fact that's one of the the great histories of all civilizations is they they peak and they atrophy and they start again but they start again at a much from a much, much lower base, but which much loftier notions. I think we should come back to the immigration issue because it's uh, it's crucial that a counter narrative is developed on, on a podcast like this and in discussions to actually damp down the anti immigrant feeling, which again we can see all over Europe. Uh, it's not here in Ireland, it doesn't really exist to some great extent, but it, our experience is very, very, very novel with immigration. Adam, listen, thanks, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. I'm a, I've been a fan and I look forward to keeping to be a fan. Cheers, Adam. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Jeez, we could talk to Adam for hours. He's great, isn't he? He's brilliant. And what insights, although apparently you've got some great insights. Well, you know, I, I, just, I didn't want to say, you know, as the, as the, you know, the Dave McWinnies oh podcast. you never hear the end know, of it. The, the Dave McWinnies podcast think tank. <laughs> <laughs> number one rated think tank in Dunleary. <laughs> Not even the number one rated think tank in Dunleary. <laughs> Come here to me, though. There was, he brought up a, a whole load of really interesting points. But the thing that interests me about the whole Brexit thing now is the leaving of Cummings, Rasputin. Yep. And 
what does that happen? like? I'd love to. I'd love to be in a fly in the wall there when he was leaving in his resignation. There must have been some row or some sort of shenanigans going on, but we don't know what happened there. But yeah. what does it actually mean? Well, I think the 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 critical thing is the this week is Brexit week. This is the week in which Barney has said either we've got a deal or we've no deal. Okay, right. now it's also the week in which the British. The personnel involved in the British side have changed profoundly. Cummings is gone. Yeah. And the question is, what does that mean? What's going on? Mm. Now, it's very, very clear that there has been a battle for the heart and soul of the Tory party going on in the UK. So you have the Tory party prior to Brexit, or prior to Johnson, yeah. the One Nations. They get eased out in the sort of rebellion in the last year. But what you have, obviously, is this battle between the advisors. Mm. Cummings being the main one, mm. and the party, right? And of course, Johnson is the head of the party as well as being the prime minister. So what you have is this battle between the two. It strikes me that the timing is not unrelated to Joe Biden. Right. That there has been a mood music change in the world. And all the little Bidens, or what I call them, the Biden deniers. You know, like <laughs> Trump's a Biden denier. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm still the boss. <laughs> it's, like being, it's like being an anti-vaxxer or something. I'm a Biden denier. I'm a climate change denier. I'm a Biden. He doesn't exist. Right? So the Biden deniers are, you know, Hungary, Poland. You can argue Modi, very much so in yeah. India. Yeah. Definitely Bolsonaro in, in, in Brazil. Putin, of course. Yeah. And finally, of course, Johnson. Johnson decided, rightly or wrongly, clearly wrongly, that he was a little Trump. That's what he would actually go and be, he was a little Trump. Yeah. Now, obviously, when Biden comes in, the first phone call was to Mickey Martin, which is quite interesting. Yeah. But the second or third phone call would have been to the United Kingdom. And I'm sure what Biden said to Johnson was, look, you're a sovereign nation, you can do what you want. However, you know, yeah. I am not hugely supportive. So the mood music changes. Or was it that Cummings just misjudged the American election and was pushing a particular agenda. I it's think, possible. yeah, it's, it is possible. But I mean, at the end of the day, the Brits do not want a no-deal Brexit. And Johnson does not want a no-deal no Brexit. Really, Cummings did want one because for Cummings, it's part of an ongoing revolution. This is the idea that he wants to break up the British state. He wants to smash the judiciary. He wants to smash the education system. He wants to destroy in order to rebuild. Mm. Like that's his sort of slightly infantile view of how to run a reasonably well-off social democracy. Yeah. Now, if they keep going down this road, and I mean, these guys are not gone. They're just gone for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of the issues that Adam Posen was there talking about will come back to the fore in the UK. Oh, I think so, definitely. Because, uh, you know, populism doesn't go away. It's just hibernating yeah. and regrouping. And it's the same in America as well. And also populism is a consequence of something else. Yeah. But I, I mean, I know it sounds extreme to say that Britain or England could be the new Argentina, but I actually believe it could. And this that whole is the, idea of so basically, Peronism. Argentina was the seventh richest country in the world in the 1920s. It's mm. now the 77th richest country. So this is a country that has everything, but because of extraordinarily bad economic management, the country has collapsed. And generation after generation after generation of Argentinians now look to a country that their grandparents had, and that country was much much more resourceful and much wealthier. Think about England, right? England is now going to go off on its own, going to try and find its way. It's got no anchor, right? Mm. Who's to say that sterling, the currency of the United Kingdom, won't end up like a Mickey Mouse currency, mm. wedged between the dollar and the euro? And if they employ this boom-bust cycle all the time, okay, where they rev up the economy, right? Yeah. Which is what the Brits have a good tradition of doing. They do this with no anchor, with no ballast. Yeah. It's not inconceivable. You know, great empires collapse. You know, we're talking about our friends, the Byzantines, right? Yeah. But you think about the Byzantines, they're, they were ruling for 1,200 years and eventually they lose to the Turks and that empire is destroyed and there's nothing, there's no, there's, there's no legacy, there's no heritage, there's nothing that's destroyed. Yeah. Big countries do go bad. This is the lesson of economics. It's the lesson of everything. If you look at economic history, what you see is that you make a few wrong decisions and suddenly you're not the country you were anymore. Mm. Britain is highly dependent on mobile capital. 
It is highly dependent to to finance its current account deficit. Mm. It's highly dependent on the goodwill of outsiders, right? Even though it's a big country. What what Adam was saying there, you know, you can go down the Cayman Islands on the Thames idea. You can go down... Yeah, what does he mean by that, actually? So Cayman Islands is a tax haven, more or less, yeah. right? And what, what, what Cayman Islands did, and, you know, I, I've always argued that all countries, a bit like Marla's argument a few months ago, all countries are entitled to deploy their tax system as part of their economic armory. Yeah. I think it's it's yeah. a legitimate side, right? So the Cayman Islands are looking. The Cayman Islands is a tiny place that was basically an adjunct to Jamaica for most of its life. Okay, there's okay. two two islands, yeah. Cayman Islands and Cayman Brac, which is a tiny little island, right? And it was a tiny place, part of the English Caribbean, of which Jamaica was the central place. Right. So in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, Caymanians all went to Jamaica to find work. If you go to the Cayman Islands now, it's full of Jamaicans coming to Cayman to find work, right. which is always the best way to look at how a country is doing. Yeah. So what the Cayman Islands figured out was, look, we have a tax system. What we'll do is we will set up an offshore financial system here and we will ask questions or we won't ask as many questions as possible. We'll get money, will come in. The money will then be recycled in the Caymans. And you know what happens? We'll end up having the highest standard of living in the Caribbean, right. which is what they did. Right. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at the Cayman Islands, only 40 or 50 miles away is Cuba, which is the other model of what you can do. Right. So it's wedged <laughs> between Jamaica, yeah. which up until very recently was incredibly dangerous, but Jamaica's turned around dramatically, and Cuba. And then you have this little place, the Cayman Islands, right? But what he's saying, the Cayman Islands could do this because it had a population of 80,000. Right. It's okay. tiny, yeah, yeah. right? Mm. But what he's saying is Britain ain't going to be Singapore because it doesn't have the intellectual capital to do it. And in fact, what, what has happened is Ireland has got there first. So we've actually got there before them in attracting in the foreign companies and the manufacturing and all that sort of stuff, right? But, but he's saying, so all they'll have to do, all they'll have now is to become the Cayman Islands, on, or Caymans on the Thames, which is to reduce profoundly their regulatory oversight. Right, yeah. Which basically means letting in Russian oligarchs. Yeah. To, but they're already there. They are already there. So it's, it's already a little bit yeah. like that. Yeah, but even more so. It is. It yeah. is like that. So that's what he's saying is, and I think it's interesting, is their model, they're too big to do what little countries do, and they're too little to do what big countries do. <laughs> and that's their problem, right? And if you come back to the Argentinian example is, if they get this wrong, if, for example, they, be, they go into a not even a spiral, but a progressive period where you're sitting on past victories, which is really the populist play yeah. list. And you allow Peronism to emerge. So Peronism is all about Juan Peron and yeah. Vita Peron, which is the idea is Argentina will basically create its own industries. We don't necessarily need the world because we're quite rich. And you know what? We were rich before everybody else, yeah, the Argentinians yeah, yeah. felt. They looked down their nose at the rest of Latin America, right? which has always been the, the, the case in Argentina. It's a great country, but there's, yeah. if you talk to other Latin Americans, they say the Argentinians are real snobs, yeah. okay, in, in terms of... And, a little bit like the Brits in Europe. Exactly. Yeah. And also the Argentinians are white. Right. Yeah. Right. They eliminated their native populations. Yeah. They have no black population unlike yeah. Brazil or Colombia or whatever. So there's a lot of stuff going on yeah, there. There's a lot of Christian brothers there too. There's a lot of Christian brothers there too. <laughs> Newman College is actually where they all... Oh, right. Went, okay. yeah. Yeah, but yeah. that's another story. The Christian brothers are actually in Montevideo in You're Uruguay. Right. Do you remember the movie? This is a real tangent. Oh God, this is a test. There was a rugby team in the 1970s. Alive. Alive. Yeah. And that rugby team were from Montevideo. Yeah. But the rugby team were called the Old Christians. Right. You know, this is your Christian brother riff now, John. Right, yeah, yeah. And those guys went to a school called the Stella Maris Christian Brothers School in Montevideo. Google it. And it was created in the 1950s by Irish Christian brothers. And they brought rugby to Uruguay. That's wife. right, yeah. They yeah. brought to Uruguay. And, so, and the Argy's now beaten the All Blacks. The All Blacks, which, yeah. is, which is great. So let's, the big picture, what Adam is saying is Brexit economically, as we've always been saying, it's a nonsense, right? Yeah. It's a nationalist project of a country or a section of the population that resents, let's come back to this, that mm. resents the fact that people who don't look, speak, and act like them are doing quite well. So it's not that he was talking about, you know, the white working class Brits actually done really bad. 
They've just done bad relative to the people who used to do really bad. So to black people or brown people or immigrants or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. And this comes back to the Northern Irish loyalist point we were making. Mm. You know, what, what really aggrieves these people is not that they've slipped back. It's actually the other guys have actually come up. Right. And that's what... So they resent yeah. other people's success. So rather than saying, okay, here's the new world, how do we deal with it? They say, can we recreate the old world before these people were successful? So what do we want? We want red, white, and blue. We want it to be white. We want it to be yeah. homogenous. We yeah. don't want immigrants. We don't want Europeans. So basically, we don't want anything that represents modernity. Because if you go back to modernity, right, think about the concept of yeah. modernity and the modernist movement, right? Modern art, modern architecture, all that. Modernism is about an ability to adapt to change and go with the flow and embrace the new. Yeah. And if you can't embrace the new, you embrace the ancient. And the reason you embrace the ancient, like our friends in Brexit, is because you're afraid of the new. So what is actually going on in the world is this extraordinary pull and tug and battle between countries and individuals mm. who embrace the new world and countries and individuals who hate the new world because it threatens them and they want to go back to something else. And I think that's the way we should see Brexit. So this week, do you think it's a bit late getting rid of Dominic Cummins now, that lot? But actually, it was interesting what Adam was saying there about uh, free trade is is yeah. not the same as uh, a single market. Well, you see, again, let's go back to this idea between the ancient and the new, right? Yeah. Only people who don't understand modernity think that free trade and a single market are similar, right? Mm. So somebody who actually believes that economics is about making ships and exporting them, big stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As it was in the 1950s, yeah. right? Because there was no service economy, right? Think about it, right? Only people like that can equate a free trade deal, which is a very ancient, old-fashioned concept with a single market. What a single market is, is it's something that says your goods but not your goods, your services, what you sell in the world. I will recognize your norms, your standards, your requirements, yeah, et cetera, yeah. right? Yeah. That's quite different to a trade deal where England is strong. The three biggest industries they have are finance, advertising, and the Premier League. Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. that's it, right? They're really good at sports franchises, yeah. okay? So finance, it's all services, not covered by trade covered by the single market. Right. Advertising. And when I say advertising, I mean the sort of, the persuasion game. Yeah, The Brits yeah. are really good at. Yeah, yeah. All the whole about, industry. Yeah. yeah, all about standards. Football, selling, buying players. It's all about the marketing of a game. Yeah. All this stuff is not covered by trade because it isn't actually trade in stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Trade I know what you mean. It's concepts, ideas, soft power, all the stuff we talk about, yeah. you know. And the modern countries that do well Trade in stuff, John, that is light, not heavy. Think about this, right? Yeah. Poor countries trade in heavy stuff. This is actually physically heavy. Right. Okay. okay. Rich okay. countries trade in light stuff, in brain power, in ideas. Services. In patents, as, as in marketing. To products. Yeah, yeah. That's where the value added is. So the Brits, God bless them, still think of trade as being heavy, coal, metal, big things, right? Yeah where in actual fact the world has moved on and they're going to be left behind. I thought it was really interesting what he was saying about this whole concept of the gravity of trade. Yeah. I never yeah. heard that before. Well, I mean, it's a, one thing is you tend to trade with people who live close to you. But more importantly, John, think about all business, right? You do business with people you know. Mm. That's the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You buy off people you know. You sell to people you know, Right. The chances of knowing somebody in Korea are much less than the chances of knowing somebody up the road. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So in actual fact, it's not even a great, it's a, it's a common sense idea. So the, the British idea that global Britain will be, you know, they, they talk about buccaneering Britain. Yeah. They forget that the buccaneers were pirates. <laughs> no. Do you know what I mean? They were yeah. buccaneers because they actually went to the Caribbean and robbed the gold from the Spaniards but, but, that the gold had robbed from the Indians. Yeah, but or the, the Spaniards had robbed from the Indians. The buccaneers were actually mercenaries. They were mercenaries. And they actually robbed and stole with the state's blessing. Yeah, so think about it. So gravity makes complete sense in business. 
not just because of physical proximity, but because of emotional proximity. And it's this idea of networks. Mm. Network economics is so important, right? You never see this in economic textbooks, right? That your network, the people around you, the people who speak to each other, that whole idea is phenomenally important in terms of the final decision who do you do business with? Yeah, yeah. Right? So this is that's why the idea is you cut the network you have and yeah. you put up barriers against the network you've already established in order to build a network with people you don't even know. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Come here, let's just to finish off then, I just want to come back around to kind of populism and what you were saying there. And what Trump has been pushing was this the end of globalism. Yes. Which, you know, this all this whole Brexit thing feeds into now as well. But where where does it leave populism now with Biden in or soon to be anointed? You know, wh- where's populism well, now? It's, it's, it's funny. I think that the mood music change is important. Mm. It's not absolutely critical, but it's important because it, it takes away the permission from the mini Trumps yeah. to behave badly as a general rule because they're looking over the shoulder at the White House And they're saying, well, for the last four years, I had the blessing of the White House to go down this patriotic, this exclusionary route. Now they're looking over at Biden and thinking, "Mm, maybe I don't have the permission. So America is still enormously important. And whoever sits in the White House is crucially important. But to actually summarize what populism is, my old mate, you know Martin Lusto? Yeah. Okay, Argentinian, former ambassador to the United States. He runs his own political, he's the head of the Senate now. In Argentina. Is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got his own he's political... Fire. Yeah, he's great. He's a fast, fascinating guy. But he said, he, t- he said a great thing about populism in Argentina. He said, the populists in Argentina make great patriots and shit citizens. And I thought it was a beautiful line. Wow. Right? And he said, so beware the great patriot and the terrible citizen, because they're usually one and the same thing. Yeah. So he says, the great patriot puts on the flag and talks about this and that and how brilliant we are. You ask him to pay tax or volunteer, or do something properly for the citizenship, no way. I'm going to run away. So if you look at all the populists, they say things like, we are the most patriotic people ever, yeah. right? Yeah, but, but we're going to cut taxes for really rich people. Yeah. Think about they all do this, right? And we're going to destroy the social welfare for really yeah. poor people. And we're not going to have any gelling agent that pushes the, the society together, right? So they make great patriots mm. and terrible citizens, Right. The UK, well, not the UK, England is at risk of having been taken over by a cabal of great patriots and terrible citizens. And when you look around the world as a political philosophy, John, I think, <laughs> yeah. on the basis of this is the best think tank in Dunleary. Of course. Uh, I think we should probably aim for the opposite, to be great citizens and kind of lukewarm, wishy-washy patriots. That would do me fine. While I have you, John and I put this together with James, as you know, every week. And it's great fun and we're really enjoying it. However, it does cost. It costs a lot. So it would be great if you could support us on Patreon. Now, what you get on Patreon is number one, if you don't like ads, you get no ads. Number two, you get Q&A, which is basically almost like our own little conversation about each episode after the episode. You ask the questions, didn't get that? Explain that a little bit more. I answer on the episode. You also get every two weeks a bespoke economics tutorial on an issue, a concept, a theory of economics that you ask me and I answer called Ask Mac. And of course, finally, you get all the economic content, all the course, all the lecture notes, all the reading lists on the David McWilliams Global Economics Course. So support us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. Cheers. <laughs>